O Tetsuo, O Madness, be here with me. Let go the light so through dark I'll see. Hello and welcome back to an episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben, a.k.a. El Benito Peligroso. And today we're going to revisit the 1988 cult science fiction cyberpunk classic anime Akira. Or perhaps I'd be more well placed to say, finally, we're going to revisit Akira. On this channel, we do a lot of things. But if I could encapsulate everything we do into a succinct utterance, I suppose I'd phrase it, we do sci-fi and deep shit. And hell if that's not Akira in a sentence. And yet here I am, what seems like ages into the life of my channel, and I've yet to give the film its rightful exegesis, because I just couldn't find the right angle until now. Yeah, yeah, disaffected angry youth, militarization, police states, nuclear proliferation, corruption, religious fanaticism, Akira hits on it all. And Akira is brilliant. However, I guess I don't really feel like any of those themes are what makes Akira brilliant or original. Don't get me wrong. It's not that its themes are dead on arrival. Its portrayal of a society acquiesced to authoritarian megalomania, its conveyance of madness amidst unrest, and the violence and concurrent blindness of man to his own iniquity in executing such brutality are bloody fruitful and relevant ideas the film explores. But I would argue it carries out this expansive discovery without striking upon novel thoughts. Between this channel and my other one, Generation Ochi, I often stretch the importance and depth of themes from the content we explore, and in my view, doing so is all part of a fun and stimulating mental exercise. Truthfully, few films, certainly few animes, explore their themes to a level I'd be comfortable calling deeply insightful. But whatever, let's push every film we explore to its philosophical limits. And yet Akira. While it too is guilty of being somewhat thematically facile, it yet somehow feels to be a genuine work of genius. So what is this yet-to-be-articulated quality of the film, if not its intended themes, that lifts it to the level of profundity? Well, I guess its animation and its macabre visual imagination both seem authentically masterful, but I've not the expertise to speak authoritatively on such matters. What I have come to conclude, however, is that it's the unintended themes of the film, or at least what I assume are unintended themes, that makes it so powerful, so subtly sadistic, and dare I say, just a bit moving. Yes, the unintentional current of the film is that which reflects its author's neuroses, that author in question being one Katsuhiro Otomo. Indeed, what if I were to posit that Akira isn't fundamentally about any of such lofty ideas previewed by me just earlier, but instead is in essence a treatise on mental illness and its prevalence in society. I know, I know, that's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it works out for me. Restated, there's nothing profound about Akira's political philosophy or dystopian premonition. What is profound about it is its psychology, specifically that of its author, which is reflected in his world and characters. Thus, concerning Akira, the more meaningful discussion to have is a psychologically focused rather than a philosophically focused one because it's the psychology of the film and its characters therein, their pathologies and such, which infuses the story with novel substance and makes it truly worthy of distinction as a work of genius. And sometimes genius is found in the particular, which is why we're going to look closely at the character of Tetsuo for this examination. For those of you who don't remember, or just don't know, or don't care, Akira takes place in the future year 2019 in a post-apocalyptic Neo-Tokyo. Just over 30 years before, in 1988, a third world war was triggered following the sudden destruction of Tokyo by a powerful psychic being named Akira, the eponymous Akira. Now, in 2019, Tokyo has been rebuilt into a police state on artificial islands in Tokyo Bay. Neo-Tokyo is rampant with government corruption, street violence, protests, and general unrest, thus necessitating martial law. During one night of particularly barbarous upheaval and violent protest, 
Shotoro Kaneda and his biker gang, the Capsules, are clashing with their rival biker gang, the Clowns. Capsule member and Kaneda's best friend, Tetsuo, crashes his motorcycle amidst the chaos and is taken into custody by government authorities. In the hands of the government, Tetsuo is inducted into a secret government project, the mechanisms of which appear to awaken his latent psychic abilities. Abilities, the government scientists note, which are similar to that of Akira's. Tetsuo eventually escapes from captivity, and adrift in a fit of psychosis, he goes on a violent rampage across Tokyo. As he descends further and further into a mad and unruly fervor, both the government and his gang member comrades, led by Kaneda, attempt to track him down and prevent him from destroying Neo Tokyo. Now, when interpreting this film, often viewers will make a presumption that its world is real. Now wait, wait, I'm not saying that the reality presented in Akira is but a dream. You gyro roll to that. And I'm not in the mood to dissect the word real either. But in the most literal sense, the world portrayed in Akira isn't real. It's animated. It's a manifestation of its author's imagination. And I really want to start there from first principles. And the second principle is that even better yet, it's a manifestation of its author's perspective of reality, and thus what in his view banes it. Alas, for the sake of not allowing myself to fall psychologically rudderless adrift a philosophical diatribe worthy of Tetsuo's descent into delusion, the third principle and the point pertaining to my thesis I'm sailing towards here is that we can't simply trust a subjectively projective world as a most objective version of the truth. More pertinently, as his author before him, Tetsuo's own perspective isn't reliable. His brain has been manipulated, and we're seeing a vision of the world through his tainted eyes. Shortly after we meet Tetsuo, he experiences a mental transformation. However, here's the twist. The change Tetsuo experiences may on one level be the mind-altering effects of covert government manipulation via the aforementioned secret project. However, on another level, and on a level I believe to be of greater interest to us, the change Tetsuo experiences comes via a traumatic event. Well, a traumatic event incurred amidst a brutish world. Tetsuo crashes his motorcycle during the course of a violent encounter with a rival gang, as well as the police. And it's only after such a harrowing experience that most of all that is fantastical in the film takes place, starting with Tetsuo's apprehension by government forces and ensuing subjection to non-consensual experimentation on his person. What I thus argue is that Tetsuo's mental health suddenly deteriorates and his mental illness exacerbates during this height of unrest, specifically following a life-threatening experience. Tetsuo is someone who has been exposed to the brutality of the world, a fact which was long belied by an artificial projection of an Edenic future, a life which, as it is to so many young people, was promised to him. He's too been exposed to stress, to technology, to the pressures of the modern materialistic world, to corruption, to a soulless, sprawling city, awash in economic bloodlust, and damn it if he isn't just a kid with a hell of an impressionable mind. Tetsuo is paranoid, insecure, sexually insecure, fearful. <laughs> Feeling frustrated, Kaneda? Now do you understand how it feels being little and helpless? And when all these things collide and compound upon one another and beat his mind down, this is the world Tetsuo comes to see, and through him, we know it too. It's quite relevant, this thought, to many of you out there watching this video, so many of you who've chided and faulted Tetsuo for his wrongs, you who've, like he, long been stuck in your snidely panged minds thrust to despair. Then came the pandemic and locked you away in your room so that your minds were alone with you to do their worst, and by this misfortune didst some of you crack. Your worst thoughts burst forth, your crazy came to play. Some of you lost it, and others nay. Did you just barely hold on? Tetsuo did not. His anxiety, his depression, his despair, all at once overspilled and overcame him, and he broke down. Throughout Akira's story, Tetsuo is battling his brain. 
Not a brain that has been directly manipulated by some diabolic clandestine government agency, but by the conventional trials and tribulations of life. Real mental illness is something you can't just stop. You can't track. It's a constant battle. It's true suffering because you know something is wrong with you, but you don't know how to stop it. It's as if your brain is working separately from you. Tetsuo's worst enemy is his mind. In my view, to assert that a secret government organization is trying to imprison and kill Tetsuo is a tad misleading. I would say instead that Tetsuo believes that a secret government organization is trying to imprison and kill him. He's paranoid. Lots of people in society, a society rife with inequality, corrupt leaders, and distrust, are paranoid. Actually, humans in general are paranoid because they're afraid to die. And there's a lot of hungry predators and morally indifferent forces of nature out there ready to strike. The plot and setting of Akira is reminiscent of the world, our world, from the perspective of a paranoid person, someone who questions the moon landing, believes domestic terrorist attacks are false flag events, and thinks that a secret cabal of demonic elites are conspiring to kill the masses. Except in fiction, in Akira, it's as if the paranoid person is completely right about all of his suspicions, because all we see is what is contained in his vision, a perspective that's colored by fear and despair. In Tetsuo's reality, Everything is dark and drab. Everything is draped in the colors of night and blood. And in this world, malevolent organizations and forces act in secret underground. An entire world of illicit activity spans the sewers and tunnels below. This is not a realistic conception of the world, but a fanciful conception imagined by a tried and anxious mind. It's of course then undeniable that we're somewhat recapitulating Tetsuo as a protagonist. When you're paranoid or even mentally ill, you're not wantonly violent despite lashing out on unsuspecting civilians, you're only protecting yourself from undercover agents of destruction. You're acting in self-defense and everyone else is crazy. In some compartments of his mind, Tetsuo is the hero of his story, not a raging maniac run amok. And yet, he's also sometimes aware of his abnormal thoughts and behaviors. <laughs> what the hell is going on with me? Am I dreaming? These powers, are they real or just a hallucination? Somewhere in there, he knows he's losing his mind. But he's not totally sure, and such is the dissonance in the mind of a madman. The war inside, if you will. Tetsuo recognizes something is wrong with him. But at the same time, that very something could actually be right. Are those overcome with severe anxiety or fear, with paranoia, with new perspectives of the world that show it disrobed to be frothing with evil and death? Are such people sick and twisted, or have they opened their eyes to the truth? Is Tetsuo's mind in retrograde or in progress? Is what he's experiencing madness or revelation? Well, madness, mostly, and I don't encourage it. Delusion, even. But I'm simply projecting the doubt that the ill mind affords itself, making its enticements so hard to escape. And we'd all be foolish to remain unwise to the faults of our own minds. Rap, rap, rapping away at our fragile psyches, telling us to fear, to doubt to distrust, to hide away from the world, the bad, bad world, and the death it brings. Look at social media. Paranoia, madness, anger, anxiety are all pervasive in society. And while the very most of us aren't prone to ever fall to delusion or commit evil acts like Tetsuo, on a more realistic level, we're all vulnerable to battling with our minds, to being conquered by anxiety, to seeing the world as a lonely, dark, and dangerous place more so than is true of it. And Tetsuo? His mind is most vulnerable of all, given whatever mix of nature and nurture led him to the events in Akira, the film within which he sinks to his lowest depths. He isn't growing more psychically powerful as the movie progresses, rather, he's maddening. He's incrementally losing control of his mind. There's a moment well into his descent when a choir rouses from the ether and buries the dialogue beneath it, and I can't help but wonder... <laughs> Bye.
Is this not some regular soundtrack musings, but something instead that Tetsuo and Tetsuo alone can hear? In retrospect, the movie scenes comprise a series of escalating fantastical moments, moments defined by nonsensical, ridiculous happenings as Tetsuo gradually morphs into, well, a super being. Concurrently, his friend Kaneda seems to be similarly traumatized given their shared experiences of the world. And it triggered the fall of Tokyo. And, and that power is something, something that is totally beyond our... <gasps> Kaneda isn't immune to maladies of the mind, but he's less vulnerable than Tetsuo and perhaps even of sturdier mental health due mostly to nature. Kaneda never quite acquiesces to mental illness in the way or to the degree Tetsuo does. Now, it's worth pausing for a moment to inquire as to whether or not I'm purposely and frivolously broadening the definition of mental illness to satisfy the thesis of my video while maintaining the term's power in terms of the connotation and stigma it entails. Could I thus be the very type of superficial, sanguine pundit I so despise? He who would declare that the entire populace hath fallen to mass formation psychosis? To be honest, I hope not. I hope not to posit a theory so ambiguous in terms that it's incontestable. I intend instead to rightly define a pervasive problem in society without stringing along any sort of one-size-fits-all stigma. The term mental illness alone need not be so narrowly cast, for it can manifest to many extents, both in subtle tics and blatant tongues. I'm speaking not to any one measure of mental ailment, but broadly to the thin line between a touch of madness and a slightest sanity. Illness is an integral part of life. Anxiety is life. Breakdowns are life, and we all have our worst moments. There's a brief aside towards the end of Akira when we're made privy to better days. When Tetsuo was young and yet unwearied, his soul still unsullied by common human trauma. And in this moment, we're made to ask ourselves, is this the correct perspective of the world? Is this the world in truth? Well, perhaps the answer there is, too vast for these but simple servers, but what I will suppose is that Tetsuo's illness comes to help him cope. As his world grows to be too much to bear, his mind finds a way to flee what's real. Maybe then, Tetsuo doesn't weaken as his mind absconds, but on the contrary, his illness makes him strong enough to continue in a world which is overcoming him. It's the very truth he can't consume, and so his mind makes a new one. One that says, yes, there's all these depraved forces in the world, but he's strong, stronger than them. He's in control. He's triumphant or all what entreats him fall. If he dies this way in this mode, will he ever know he wasn't so? For what more is truth to be than all that the eyes can see? Oh, the ways we go, when troubles find us and the mind falters. At a point of singularity, when mental degradation shall, beyond the approaching limits, be irreversible, and spiritual redemption unattainable, such is the time to fight most fiercely. Some shall then will themselves back to life, to stability, and others, others won't return. They'll be lost to new dimensions out of reach, somewhere in the blindest confines of their restive minds. And who's to say that place, that secret place known soul to them, isn't a better place to be? Anyways, those are my thoughts on Akira. Please do know I wrote the script for this video long before any horrific events took place in the real world, so there's no reason for it, but that I wanted to do a video on Akira. Please do give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Comment down below, let me know what you think. Remember to subscribe to this channel and hit that damn notification bell so you don't miss a damn thing. For now, my name is American Ben. I'll catch you next time. Generation Films. Peace.